Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the grace that you have bestowed upon us. We are not worthy of the, the love, the care, the, the healing that you have given freely to us. But Lord, we know that you care about our salvation more than anything, more than even your own life. Jesus, thank you so much for coming to this earth to die and, and facing a situation where you, you would rather be blotted out of existence than lose your precious children. What an incredible truth that we cannot even scratch the surface of comprehending. Lord, as we think about how to move forward with practical steps today, I pray that you would empower and inspire every man to take this on and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In Jesus' name, amen. I heard an interesting statement. I read an interesting statement, rather. I sometimes hear them and sometimes read them. But in this case, I was reading a little book called Steps to Christ. And I read a statement that just stood out at me in a very, very magnified way. It said the following. Everything depends upon the right action of the will. Everything depends upon the right action of the will. Now, if you believe that that, that, that my destiny in life will be determined based upon the action of the will that I take. Will I look and live? Will I walk forward in newness of life? Will I take the steps necessary to surrender every cherished idol, to have a completely new life, and to really reformat everything I'm doing? It's all on the table before the Lord. If I'm willing to go there, then... I have exercised the will and my eternal destiny will be shaped by this. Now remember, the accomplishment is not in myself. The power is not in myself, but the will does matter. And I want to remind you of a quotation we saw in session one. Do you remember this one from Mind, Character, and Personality? If Satan seeks to turn the mind to low and sensual things, bring it back. When corrupted imaginings seek to gain possession of your mind, Flee to the throne of grace and pray for strength from heaven. But by the grace of Christ, it is possible for us to reject impure thoughts. Jesus will attract the mind, purify the thoughts, and cleanse the heart from every secret sin. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And listen to this part, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ from 2 Corinthians. It is possible, brothers and sisters, that we can have a completely purified mind, that we can take every thought captive. It's a promise right there that God will accomplish this in us. But everything depends on the right action of the will. And this is where I see that we're in some big trouble as a people. We have a problem. If everything depends upon the right action of the will, if I have to engage the will by God's strength and power in order to take my thoughts captive, then I'm in trouble if this organ is not functioning at its peak capacity. And we are, frankly, in a situation where our prefrontal cortex is out for the count. You remember this from earlier. You've got the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, and the limbic system. The limbic system is the gas pedal. It says, go for it. Go down that pathway of lust. The prefrontal cortex says, no, slow down, hold on. You don't want to go there. That's not going to be healthy and reasonable and holy and uplifting to God and, and beneficial to yourself or anybody. The prefrontal cortex needs to be exercised in a healthy way. It needs to be functioning in a healthy way in order for us to exercise the will. And presently, we live in a highly limbic society. We live in a, a country, we live, live in an age where we are limbically inclined. The limbic system is on fire all the time. The prefrontal cortex has been damaged through diet, through lifestyle, through media choices. And here we now have to ask ourselves about serious lifestyle changes. I know that many, not all, but many men struggling with, with lust and pornography addiction and these things really could afford to take seriously some of these diet and lifestyle questions. That's going to be the first component of this session. In the latter half of the session, we'll look at actual thought exercises that you can engage in where you'll have a practical way out of a lust, lustful thought. But I want to begin with this thought right here, the brain. Is the brain going to be affected by our lifestyle? You can count on it. In fact, a healthy body means a healthy brain because the brain is part of the body, right? Mind, character, and personality affirms this very concept. Listen to this. Whatever detracts from physical vigor weakens mental effort. 
Hence, every practice unfavorable to the health of the body should be resolutely shunned. We also read that the health of the mind is dependent upon the health of the body. Now, this is not just mind, character, and personality, but you also hear this from Dr. John Rady. He was a top neuroscientist who wrote The User's Guide to the Brain. And his quotation goes something like this. Critics sometimes claim that a focus on ordinary measures like exercise and diet is too simplistic to affect unordinary behavior. Not so. The brilliantly simple evidence from exciting new areas of physical and social science shows how powerful such universal factors can be in affecting the brain-body system. Factors such as diet and exercise he's talking about. There are many tools right at our fingerprints for changing our mental health, both in correcting our problems and simply becoming the kind of person we want to be. And so the body affects the brain. Simple things like diet and exercise affect the brain. So let's talk about these ordinary measures. Let's talk about our diet and how this relates to overcoming pornography or lust and these behaviors. If you read in Mind, Character, and Personality the following, you will see that the affliction of the stomach affects the brain. Satan sees that he cannot have so great power over minds when the appetite is kept under control as when is it, it is indulged. And he is constantly at work to lead men to indulgence. Under the influence of unhealthful food, the conscience becomes stupefied, the mind is darkened, and its susceptibility to impressions is impaired. We also read that the brain and nerves are in sympathy with the stomach. Erroneous eating and drinking results in erroneous thinking and acting. And one more, it cannot be too often repeated that whatever is taken into the stomach affects not only the body, but ultimately the mind as well. Gross and stimulating food fevers the blood, excites the nervous system, and too often dulls the moral perceptions so that reason and conscience are overborne by the sensual impulses. It is difficult and often well nigh impossible for one who is intemperate in diet to exercise patience and self-control. Did you hear that? It is difficult and well nigh impossible for us to exercise self-control if we're being intemperate with our diet. This is going to be a step that needs to be taken in overcoming the lust of the eyes and the flesh. We need to deal with appetite as well. Hey folks, if you're enjoying the program, open up another tab and head over to beltoftruth.tv. You'll see all of our other seminars and topics there from parenting seminars, breaking free from the social control of the power elite through the worldly media and schooling agendas, American history, the history of the pilgrims, history of abortion, overcoming media addictions, bunch of practical topics, and those who believe in our message and want to support the work we are doing, please consider subscribing there. It's free for the asking for those who can't afford the $7 a month, but subscribe at beltoftruth.tv for all of our content. Now listen to a more modern example. This is nutritionist Elizabeth Summers. She explains it the following way. She says, repeated poor food choices can set fundamental patterns in the production of the brain chemicals that regulate appetite and mood so that you become a victim of mood swings, food cravings, poor sleep habits, and other emotional problems because of poor eating habits. And she's not the only one. You also read again in Mind, Character, and Personality. In overeating or in partaking of improper articles of food, this indulgence strengthens the animal propensities and blunts the nobler sentiments of the mind. Overeating befogs the brain, we read. And so this is a serious thing. If we want a clear brain, if we want to be able to say, I'm going to conquer this, this, this issue in my life, we need a clear mind and not just that. We don't want the animal propensities to be encouraged. We want them to be tamed and governed. Listen to this insight from Dr. John Fernstrom. He says the following. Can what we eat influence mental function? The answer is certainly affirmative. Over the past 40 years, several lines of investigation have shown that the chemistry and function of both the developing and the mature brain are influenced by diet. So what kinds of foods? How about this one? Sugar is not good for the stomach. It causes fermentation and this clouds the brain and brings peevishness into the disposition. We read also about sugar from 
Janice Keller Phelps, who was a physician who ran a drug detoxification clinic for 20 years. She worked with over 20,000 addicts and she said the following, sugar addiction is the world's most widespread addiction and probably one of the hardest to kick because it is shared by so many addicted patients. I believe that is the basic addiction that precedes all others. So we read that eating this, uh, this sugar is going to becloud the brain and lead to peevishness in the disposition. It's going to affect our mind. And we're reading also that it's an addiction. People have an addiction to these highly stimulating, highly refined sugars that we have in our modern diet. Listen to this insight from Bart Hobel, Princeton University psychologist. He says, highly palatable foods and highly potent sexual stimuli, the two things we're talking about right now, right? He says, these are the only stimuli capable of acting the dopamine system in the brain with anywhere near the potency of addictive drugs. So when we're talking about our diet and we're talking about the sexual lust, we're dealing with something that is drug-like in nature. Sugar addiction has been documented in rats and, and food addiction uh, is, is an issue for many people. It, it probably deserves a whole nother series of discussions and, and research and seminar material to help people overcome this particular thing. In fact, we're working on a seminar right now called Counterfeit Food, exposing and escaping the food addiction trap and the lies that are being brought forth, like we talked about earlier, the Twinkie. It's a counterfeit food. And so this thing needs to be overcome, but don't wait till, till that seminar is available. Deal with this appetite of food while dealing with the lusts of, of the sexual nature. It's the same reward circuits involved in the brain. So we don't wanna say I'm gonna deal with one and not the other because the other will then take over your life. We wanna gain complete self-control and victory in all these areas in our lives. And by the way, your cravings for this unhealthy food, they're largely going to go away if you focus on good foods. Fill the stomach with amazingly healthful, ultra nutritious food that we have available to us. Your sugar cravings will go away. Your need to have that highly stimulating, exciting, tasty food will go away. And don't think of this as de deprivation. Don't think of it as I don't get to eat this. I don't get to do that. Think of this is what I do get to do. Focus on that and this, this is expanding the food repertoire of what you get to enjoy. Start off with a, with a really, really healthy breakfast. That'll get the day started, but unfortunately many start with coffee. We read that coffee is a hurtful indulgence. It temporarily excites the mind, but the after effect is exhaustion, prostration, paralysis of the mental, moral, and physical powers. The mind becomes enervated, and unless through determined effort, the habit is overcome, the activity of the brain is permanently lessened. So did you hear that? Brain activity is going to be lessened by caffeine intake, by, by drinking coffee. It's enervated, but it's not true food. It's another counterfeit energy, right? Caffeine has been dubbed the counterfeit, or the, uh, the, the bad habit glue because it reinforces other bad habits. If you're trying to overcome lust, you don't want to be drinking coffee. You want to quit that immediately, right? But upwards of 90%, they tell us, our act of Americans, upwards of 90% are, are, are taking this drug every day. And as little as just one cup of coffee per day can, produ can produce withdrawal symptoms. That's what Johns Hopkins University has found. Just one cup, well, I only drink a cup, but you're addicted to that cup. This is dependence-like behavior that's, that's being observed in, in, in all coffee users who are studied by this. Caffeine leads to fatigue, depression, Irritability, mental fog. Do we want these things when we're overcoming lust? Quality, loss of quality sleep, dehydration, which again reduces mental abilities. It increases stress sensitivity, increases anxiety. It encourages the loss of nutrients such as calcium, magnesium, and B vitamins. So every single one of those is something that we do not want when we're facing this battle of overcoming. We don't want any of those things that coffee are doing, that is doing to us. So quit immediately. You need, you need healthful energy. You need true alertness. That comes from a good night of sleep. That comes from plenty of exercise. That comes from a good, healthy breakfast. And you need to schedule longer times for sleep if you're coming off of caffeine. You need to be deliberate about these things. Plan it into your day because I'll tell you, if you're feeling sluggish and that temptation to go for the coffee is there, you've got to have something to replace it with. Get that water. Chug a bush, pound a bunch of water. Become a, a water freak. You've got to drink a ton of water. That'll help in a lot of ways. And, and, and it'll, it'll replace the bad with something good. By the way, if you don't eat breakfast, 
your body is running on nervous energy. When this happens, a hormone is released in the body called cortisol. And that makes you, a little, makes you more edgy. It makes you more susceptible to depression, to mood swings. It's just the opposite of what we want when we're overcoming habits. So we don't want that cortisol to come up. Another thing we need to get rid of is alcohol. If you're drinking any alcohol, that's what it does to the brain. Boy, that could be a seminar in and of itself right there, couldn't it? You see the normal spec scan on the left, and you see the damage effects of, these are non-alcoholics, but they're drinking alcohol daily, and that has a significant effect. Even just one drink a day, even just one drink at any time impairs prefrontal cortex function. You never want to do that, ever. Get your antioxidants from grapes and berries, okay? You don't need wine in order to live a healthy life. This is nonsense. And so you can get all these things from a healthy diet. You don't need to be ruining your brain in the process. So those are the don'ts, you know, caffeine, alcohol, we want to get those out. But what, what are some things that we can bring in? What are the, what are the do's, if you will? How about that healthy breakfast? Start out with nothing and seeds, grains and fruit. Have a good big breakfast. And then when you move on to lunch, fill that lunch with vegetables, grains, legumes, these kinds of things, and eat plenty at these two meals. The, thing, the way we do it is the opposite. We, we have coffee and a donut for breakfast, and then we have our big giant meal right before we go to bed, a couple hours before we go to bed in the evening. This is not wise. Your body needs the energy and the sustenance throughout the day, so you start early, you start big, early and then you taper off as the day goes on in terms of eating. So breakfast and lunch, we're, we're retraining our body to enjoy food at the proper time. And if you're, if you're filling your stomach right before you go to bed, this is going to be problematic for sleep. We're going to get back to the sleep and rest in just a minute. But you, you, another thing, another reason you need all those healthy things that were just on the screen, you need plenty, of, especially grains, nuts, and seeds. The, the pornography addict needs a lot of these things because you're zinc deficient, right? Those are going to replace zinc. Whole grains, nuts and seeds, get, get a lot of those during the first month of, of practicing this new lifestyle. If you do eat or need a third meal, keep it to grains and fruit. Those are easily digested so you don't have food in your stomach when it's time to go to bed. And by the way, these meals should be spaced out. You don't want them like two and a half hours apart. You don't want them right on top of each other. Ideally, you're looking at five hours between meals would be best. And so sometimes that just rules out the evening meal just because you had your lunch late and you had your breakfast a little later. And, and, and two meals is, is better than three, generally speaking. And what kinds of foods are we eating? You saw it. Whole grains, fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, all of these wonderful vegetables, of course, all of these wonderful plant foods. Plants are living nutrients. This is the food from the Garden of Eden. This is God's appointed diet. All this eating of, of animals in the Bible times was a necessity. It was, it was by permission. It was by, well, they had to. The flood comes. All the vegetation is gone. And so, of course, you have to eat the animals at that point in order to survive. And so God appointed clean versus unclean animals in the Bible, but he never intended that we would need to eat those perpetually, right? We're not going to be killing and eating animals in heaven, right? And in, in the new earth when there is no more death. And so we don't want to be doing that in an agricultural context today where we do not have to because we have so many of the good ultra nutrient, just, just filled with nutrients, plant, plant foods in abundance. Eat them in abundance, enjoy them. Don't view this as restrictive. Don't say, well, I'm not eating meat, and so I'm going to be, you know, uh, deprived. No, 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 no. I'll tell you something. I gave up eating meat six years ago, and I have never enjoyed food as much as I do today. I, I really enjoy food a lot more because there is so much variety when you go into this whole plant-based world and all the different recipes. And I, I, There's food I had never heard of that I love now. It's my favorite kinds of food. Well, what you see here is it's going to need to be fiber and complex carbohydrates that are the best for the brain. Complex carbohydrates come from whole grains, vegetables, beans, and fruits, right? And take them in their natural, full fiber form. So you're eating these things in the whole food way. These aren't highly processed foods, right? The wonderful thing about these foods is they release energy slowly over a four to six hour period. If you eat a donut, that's going to give you a quick fix, right? If you eat a, a chocolate bar, it gives you a quick burst of energy, but it subsides fast and you crash, and so you're not going to have enough energy. But eating good, nutritious, plant-based foods in a whole food form it's going to last you for many hours. Also, it increases serotonin, which is the feel-good hormone. We want that, right? It reduces emotional distress, and it satisfies your appetite. Full fiber, complex carbohydrates. You can't beat it. And I'll tell you, adults who eat high-fiber breakfasts in studies have been shown to be more productive, to think more clearly, 
and to have fewer cognitive difficulties. And isn't that exactly what we're going for? This is exactly what we want as the people of God. We want to eat these plant-based foods to give us the mental energy we need to overcome. And you know what? Another factor is these plant-based foods are going, to get, are going to give us antioxidants, which fight against free radical damage in the brain and, or in the cells all throughout the body. So this is going to be helpful on so many levels. I'm only giving you just a, just a window into the, the health message here. But these vegetables also contain carotenoids, which if you eat carotenoids regularly, it lowers stress hormones reduces irritation and reduces insomnia. Again, these are all things that are going to be helpful in our recovery plan. Meat eating, you read in Mind, Character and Personality, deranges the system, beclouds the intellect and blunts the moral sensibilities. Do you want that in your journey of recovery here? Not at all. In fact, reading on, it says meat's influence is to excite and strengthen the lower passions. Meat is going to strengthen the lower passions and has a tendency to deaden the moral powers. Grains and fruits prepared free from grease and as in, in as natural condition as possible should be the food for the tables of all who claim to be preparing for translation to heaven. The less feverish the diet, the more easily can the passion be controlled. And interestingly, they're also finding in modern research that the standard American diet, the standard Western diet, which is high in fats and sugars, a lot of meat, a lot of junk food, it actually it, it disrupts testosterone in the body. Now, do we want our testosterone levels being, being altered and messed with by our diet? Not at all. This is something that, deals, that we're dealing with, obviously, in this seminar. We don't want to mess around with that. The Annals of Neurology Journal has, has, has linked fat found in meat with poor cognitive health. They found that beef, butter, and processed snacks fared poorly on three cognitive function tests administered over the span of four years. Those who ate fats from plants though, avocados, nuts, seeds, olive oil, they all demonstrated superior brain power. So we do need those fa fats. You need omega-3 fatty acids. These are essential fatty acids because they're essential for brain function especially. So don't say all fat is bad. The fat in an avocado, in a nut, in a seed is important for brain function. So get those things. But the animal fats, again, they are beclouding the brain. They are stupefying. They're not helping brain function. It's the plants that will do that that will help brain function. So get those fats, avocados, et cetera. And, and, and by the way, there, there are different um, kinds of essential fatty acids. You got your DHA, EPA, ALA. Make sure to be getting the, the, your flax seeds. Those are gonna be filled with, with fats. And, and I know a lot of people out there saying, well, you gotta eat fish. You gotta have your fish oil in order to get your DHA and EPA essential fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids. It's, that, it's totally not necessary. If you're concerned that you're not getting sufficient DHA and EPA through your, through your uh, fatty acids that you're taking in, by the way, the body converts the, 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 the plant ones into the DHA and EPA. But some people are, I want to take it in, in, in my mouth instead of letting my body convert it. Okay, they've got a great supplement out there based upon the algae from the plants that the fish are eating, right? So you're getting your DHA and EPA right from its plant source instead of going to the mercury in the fish to get that. And I, I'm going to make you a promise right now. I know some of this may strike you as pretty radical. Really? I'm going to be eating plants? Really? i got to give up my coffee and never drink a, a drink of alcohol? If some of this is striking you as, as I'm, I'm skeptical about this, I'm not sure I want to do this, I'm going to make you a promise, okay? Try this for 90 days. If you don't find that you feel better, if, if you feel worse, 90 days later, you may feel worse right away because you're detoxifying, but after 90 days, if you still feel worse, I will buy you a Big Mac, okay, and a milkshake. I, I'm kidding, actually. Don't come to me with that. But honestly, I, I would make that pro promise if I could in good conscience, but because I'm so certain that this lifestyle will make you feel better. I can promise you that. The reason the youth have so little strength of brain and muscle is because they do so little in the line of useful labor. So it's more than just diet. What else are we talking about here? Look, this is what happened with Sodom. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Sexual sin, right? How did sexual sin occur? Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. 
was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So why did God have to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom had engaged in all of this terrible sexual sin. It was one of the reasons was idleness, right? Idleness. And we've got to ask ourselves, what are we doing with our bodies throughout the day? Not just what are we putting in them, but what are our bodies doing? Because remember, a healthy body is going to be a healthy brain, is going to be strength to overcome. Are we getting enough exercise? Listen to this. The whole system needs, the, the whole system needs the invigorating influence of exercise in the open air. A few hours of manual labor each day would tend to renew the bodily vigor and rest and relax the mind. Isn't that interesting? The mind needs relaxation by hard work of the body. And so this reinvigorates the mind and it gives us a stronger mind if we are doing something outside and exercising our body. Also, part of this is you're going to be breathing better and you're going to be having better oxygen from the outdoors, right? Remember that earlier that we studied about the importance of, of, of taking a deep breath Oxygen to the brain, you know, you can't get any better than exercising outside in, in nature for getting that good oxygen. It literally will change brain structure if you're sedentary. You will literally have negative effects if you're sedentary. But exercise will make you feel better, not only emotionally, but physically. And when you feel better, you think better, and then you'll be able to say, I can have control over these thoughts. Everything depends on the right action of the will. We want that will as strong as possible. Now, though, here are the benefits of exercise. Improves mood. Lowers stress. Lowers depression. Lowers anxious feelings. Increases brain power. Increases energy levels. Improves sleep. And a single exercise reduces tension, depression, anger, and confusion. Just going in for one exercise has all that effect. A 10-minute walk yields one hour of increased energy and reduced tension. Interesting. Exercise is used in the treatment of fatigue. Moderate intensity exercise is better than high intensity exercise in order to reduce anxious thoughts. Regular exercisers have fewer stress hormone re releases when stress does occur. Exercisers are less lonely, shy, and hopeless. Exercise increases a sense of self-worth. Exercise increases cerebral blood flow, that's the cerebral cortex in the brain, increases the ability of neurotransmitters and affects brain structure. That is huge. Exercise improves executive control functions of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. You don't get any more important than that with this victory march. Exercise activates chemical changes in the brain that allow for greater learning and memory. Now you might ask at this point, well, what's the best form of exercise? You know, I heard moderate is better than, you know, intense exercise for those certain neurological things. Frankly, really, it doesn't matter that much. The best form of exercise is the one that you will actually do, okay? And I mean daily. And, and so whatever it is that you enjoy, whatever it is that you find tolerable, whatever it is that you will actually pull off, do it. It doesn't need to be some, you know, some sport. It doesn't need to be intensely strenuous, even just an hour walk in the morning. Just do it daily. Make sure you're doing it every single day. That's the key here with exercise. Don't, don't go a week without exercising. It's going, to, it's, going to have a, it's going to take its toll and make it harder. Uh, now, when we're talking about exercise, we're not only talking about the diet, changing the life, getting outdoors, but also f our, our rest, our sleep, our balance in life. We need downtime. We need that time for reflection, meditation, relaxing, and not just being so high stress, so high intensity, always on the go. We've got too much noise going through our heads. Too many of my own thoughts. It crowds out the voice of God. You know, I want that, I want that awareness of the sense of, of, of Christ's presence like Enoch had, right? So what, what better thing than spending time in nature for this? Go outside, get outdoors and, and by yourself with God. Spending time in nature is one of the best ways to make sure that you have the, the balance that you need, but also a good night's sleep. You've got to be getting that seven to eight hours of sleep per night for adults. During the, during the teen years, it's higher than that, more like nine for it, especially when you're heading toward age 20. Age 18, 19, you need over nine, nine and a half hours. So guess, what, guess when in your day new knowledge is absorbed by the brain? It's while you're sleeping in the deep stages of sleep. And so the new habits, the new routines, the new knowledge, the new Bible scripture memory, all of this that you're doing, the new life, the new you, is going to be assimilated into your very neurological fiber during sleep. So you need to have that good sleep. 
in order to have the new you really take hold. Sleep time is not wasted time. It, it, it relieves stress hormones and it, it and makes it so that the next day your blood sugar is controlled better. Uh, tons and tons and tons of benefits. You could have a whole, a whole seminar just on the importance of sleep. And so just get your sleep. We know it's important. There's no debating and disputing that one. So we need a practical game plan. We've changed some lifestyle patterns. Psalm 31, 39 verse 1 says, I said, I will guard my ways lest I sin. What kind of practical things can we do going forward? Mind, character, and personality recommends. Do not see how close you can walk upon the brink of a precipice and be safe. Avoid the first approach to danger. The soul's interests cannot be trifled with. First, throw away all the pornography. Obviously, right? If it's in the house, if it's in the files on the computer, get rid of it. Secondly, you're going to need to get a pornography blocking software. Put that on your phone and your computer right away. And then also this pornography blocking software can come with an accountability software. Accountability software means it reports all your electronic activities to a trusted friend or mentor who is helping to keep you accountable. You know, if you know that all the websites you visit are going to be reported to somebody, that can help as an accountability measure. By the way, this is not going to keep you from lusting after the hundreds of other places out there visually for us to see. This is going to put some protective measures in place that are going to help. If you're looking for a good software, I happen to know that Covenant Eyes is a, is a good one to, to be using. So that would be one that you could use to, to block the pornography from your computer and phone and to report um, your, your web activity. You want the accountability software as well. So every page visit is sent to somebody and they're, they're just looking. At it. So you know that somebody is watching and helping you out there. Um, and, and this is important. This is an important step, not because it's a cure-all. It's not going to cure my heart, right? I mean, I, but this is one protective measure that it'll be important for your wife, if you're married, to see. It's important for her to see that you are putting these things in place, that you are committed going forward. If she doesn't see that, that, that these changes are being made and these, these uh, accountability things are being put in, it'll make her feel more insecure about the process. So we want a whole new brain. We want a whole new experience. This is just one piece of that puzzle as far as the practical measures go. But obviously we want to reduce exposure to anything that is going to be sexually alluring. Reduce exposure, reduce exposure. We want, we want to organize our day, where we go, what we watch, what we do, around giving us the best chances to not be hit with this stuff. I mean, we're going to be hit with it at some point, but we don't want more temptation than we need, right? We pray, lead me not into temptation. And so we, are we following through with that prayer and making sure that we're not inviting temptation? I mean, think about it. If you're going to watch, turn on the TV to watch the big game, right? Oh yeah, you know, I got to watch the game. Why would I do that knowing what kind of images and commercials are going to come at me, not just during the commercials, but during the game, and I'm trying to overcome lust, and I'm subjecting my eyes to this voluntarily? Don't expect God to bail me out there. That's presumption. That's unwise. That's foolishness. And whether it's the game or going someplace or watching something, I'll tell you, just by watching TV, not watching TV, you're going to take yourself a long ways on this in terms of not engaging in these lustful behaviors. It may not just be TV. It, you have to think through your day, your life, where you most often have those triggers and those images that are capturing your attention. Avoid them to the extent possible. It's never going to be possible to completely avoid. And in fact, we don't want to completely avoid all women, right? I mean, we want to just start to develop a more sanctified view of women. And so it's just the sexually alluring things that we want to guard ourselves from. Listen to this from Mind, Character, and Personality. It says, every Unholy passion must be kept under the control of sanctified reason through the grace abundantly bestowed of God in every emergency. It says, let no arrangement be made to create an emergency. God will get us out of emergencies if we're not creating them. But those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. The heart must be faithfully sentineled, or evils without will awaken evils within, and the soul will wander in darkness. One more. You will have to become a faithful sentinel over your eyes, ears, and all your senses if you would control your mind and prevent vain and corrupt thoughts from staining your soul. 
Now, one of the ways that you can make sure to have a more pure thought life in this is, is think about this. The more time that you are spending outdoors, in nature, working with your hands, working in a garden, going for walks, going for hikes, these kinds of things are inevitably going to be preserving your mind and giving you a break from that onslaught and filling your mind with holier things. And yes, eventually you'll, you probably will be at the grocery store and that magazine cover will show up and, and shout at you and say, look at me. But we don't want to be inviting these things. We want an absolute minimum of alluring images coming at us. So reduce exposure, reduce exposure, reduce exposure to anything that will draw the eyes in these, in these channels. But, you know, despite our best efforts, that image will show up. And so what do we do when it does show up? You know, you're sitting at the bus stop or you're going in church and somebody walks into church and immodestly dressed even. What do we do when we're hit with that image? This is a huge component of this seminar. How do we redirect our thoughts? You know, we read when it starts to go down that channel of carnal indulgence, bring it back, right? When it's going into those low debasing thoughts, bring the thoughts back. How do we do this? Let's get some practical steps for how to reroute our thoughts and create new channels and pathways of the mind. We're going to go back to the fact first that God created you with a sexual nature. Let's not deny our sexual nature and say it doesn't exist. We have to ask, why did God give us a sexual nature? Because remember, every drive that he has given us is to propel us into holiness, into an understanding of him and, and how we connect with him and others. Remember, intimacy is the real drive there. So here's the key. The sexual desire that you experience when that image pops up is actually a cue. It's a reminder of your need for intimacy. So what do you do with that? The woman appears. The image appears. The sexual desire is initiated. The hippocampus says, that's good. And, and we've, we've trained our minds only to relate to this on a sexual level, on, a, on, a, on the pleasures that I can derive from this and from looking at this. And so normally we go down that Grand Canyon, right? We go down that highway with the containment walls. How do we not get into that? How do we not go down this pathway? How do we avoid the canyon? Well, imagine it like this. You, I, I want to pretend like I have right here a trampoline, okay? And many times throughout your week, you will be dropped onto that trampoline. The image hits you and you didn't choose that and, and the hippocampus is fired up and you're, you're about ready to go down the lust cascade and it's bouncing you. It's, bounce, it's going to bounce you somewhere. It is going to bounce you somewhere and the trajectory that it's bouncing you at, naturally the carnal heart will continue over this way off a cliff, if you will, okay? And so my own habits, my own conditioned responses, I just submit to the trajectory I've been bounced into here. Now, if we can, we can re-aim ourselves, the bounce will happen. The question is, where am I going to bounce? In other words, what else can we do with that initial attraction that comes other than just follow the pathway of lust? Well, listen to this one. Not only does God require you to control your thoughts, but also your passions and affections. Passions and affection are powerful agents. Positively guard your thoughts, your passions, and your affections. Do not degrade these to minister to lust. Listen to this part. Elevate the passion to, passions and affections to purity. Devote them to God. Elevate the passions and affections to purity. Devote them to God. So the passion and affection is going to take place. That initial bounce is going to take place. Can I elevate the thought into something else? Can I redirect it into something pure, into something holy? Elevate the thoughts we just read into purity and devote them to God. How do we do this? First of all, again, I want to reiterate, the sexual nature is something God gave you. Don't let the devil own this. Don't let the, uh, the devil claim ownership of this. Oh, oh see, you, you saw that image and you, you were attracted to it. Yep, I've got you in my clutches once again. No, 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 no. He comes at you with, with, with his move. And forgive me for using a judo analogy, but you, you know how judo works. You use the momentum against the person and you can use the devil's momentum in your life with this issue. He's coming after you with this and it will propel you into greater holiness. This bounce can propel you into Christ. So where do we bounce our thought? I'm not going to bounce this direction off into the cliff, but if I use a little muscle, you ever been on a trampoline? If you're coming at it that way, you can actually use a little muscle and bounce a different direction. So let's see what direction we can go. For the unmarried man, what are you going to do if you're single? It is possible, though extremely rare, that 
the woman that you see, this is a live woman, okay? This is not a woman on a screen, a billboard, a magazine cover, TV, nothing. But this is, this is a, a woman, you're unmarried, and, and you are exploring God's plan for you in terms of your future. And you get to know her a little bit in a conversation. You say, you know, I, th I think she's a lovely lady. This could be your possible future wife. Now, I know this is like a one in a million of all the possible attractive women you're going to see. So this is not that helpful in terms of the bouncing discussion here. But I, to get this out of the way, every man who's married did have an initial attraction to his wife at some point. And so that's okay. So may, may, there will be one bounce in your life, probably one, that will propel you into I, I want to get to know her a little bit more. I want to get to know her at a spiritual level, and, 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 and her character. I want to learn more about her and see, is this somebody that I would want to court? Is this a, a young lady that I would want to marry? And now, of course, this is only if you're unmarried. If you're married already, you don't do this bounce ever again, right? But that is a possibility. Now, I know this is not going to apply very often, so this is, this is not that helpful, but it's a true part of our lives, and so I don't want to deny that. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be godly either, because God has created a, a woman for many, most men to, to marry and to enjoy her beauty, and that's okay, okay? But let's get back to this overcoming lust thing. How about the real day-to-day -day life? I'm not seeing the love of my life for the first time on a normal day, and so let's say that image shows up. It's a screen or somebody in, in person or whatever. And so the, the impulse occurs, and, and I can't use that impulse to to court her, right? So what do I do with that? Am I just gonna be bounced over the cliff like normal? Or can I do something else with this, with this impulse? For the married man, here's something you can do. Take this initial impulse of attraction to this other woman and don't dwell on it for a second. Bounce your eyes off of her immediately. So you're bouncing off in a different direction. I usually literally, I actually use that, that phrase in, in, in my mind as I'm battling this. And I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm not a, a, a recovering pornography addict, but I'm a man, right? And so having struggled with this myself, a lot of what you're going to hear is things I actually do. And so I've actually used the phrase in my own life, bounce your eyes. So you immediately just bounce your eyes off that, that's that millisecond, right? But then you gotta bounce somewhere, right? Or you're, you're still in your imagination, bouncing right into the cliff. Well, you know what? This, this woman that appeared and, you know, this image that assaulted you that you didn't invite, let's, let's use a little judo move here. Let's, let's let this propel us into a love of our wife. You know, this reminded me, this image that came up just reminded me of my sexual nature and my desires and my, my intimacy with my wife. And so a deeper love for the, for the wife of my youth can occur. And so the devil's plan just backfired on him. I'm driven into deeper intimacy with my wife because of this. Isn't that wonderful? And that's a bounce that you can do. And it, of course, it does take some muscle because I'm used to just going off the cliff, right? And they've actually found in the brain, when you're trying to reroute a, a, a neuron, when you're not going down the circuit that you normally go on, the Grand Canyon, the highway, it takes more energy, electrical energy, to reroute it to a different direction. So actually, this is why we need good food, good exercise. This is why we need our brains going well. Everything depends on the right action of the will. That rerouting moment is going to be sometimes hard if we're used to just indulging in that image, right? But here you can bounce into holiness. You can direct your sexual nature toward your wife. And, and, and even, by the way, you, you go to her and, and you love her. You, you serve her. You romance her. You court her. You, you do nice things. You show interest in her. And, and it may not culminate in sexual intimacy every time, right? So it's not like this bounce is a guarantee of something. You're not doing this selfishly, right? You're, you're like Christ to her. Ephesians 5 says, Husbands, love your wives just like Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her. So we're not say, saying this is going to be some, some way where she's going to minister to my passions and I'm going to have my needs fulfilled. No, don't go there. Love the wife of your, your youth with the love of Christ. Now, as you see with both of these examples, the sexual energy that was initiated through the, through the first image is a relational energy and it gives us, it's given to, been given to us by a relational God, not for se selfish pleasure, but for intimacy. And it only should be used for its intended purposes. It becomes a deadly counterfeit if we're using it for anything else. It's like gasoline. You can pour it on, a, you can use it to power an engine or if you can pour it on a fire and it'll kill you, right? So we don't want to use our sexual energy in any way that is going to backfire and cause us to go off that cliff or burn us to death. You know, the Bible says that it's like heaping coals, burning coals on your lap is a man who's engaged in this sort of behavior. But we were propelled into, one time, courting our wife. 
or going back to the wife of our youth. Okay, so that was the, the, the advice for singles, that it'll only happen once. Now, if you're not married, though, where do I bounce, you're going? Or, you know, I'm not going to court this lady on the screen, <laughs> obviously, so where do I bounce? What do I do with that initial sexual impulse? Well, remember, for singles and for marrieds alike, by the way, this image of the woman that you're not going to court and is not your wife, it, 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 it need, you need to bounce somewhere with it. And so what do you do? Well, remember this. The Holy Spirit is given to you as an agency for redirecting your thoughts. You can't redirect your thought on your own. Don't view spiritual victory as some sort of ethereal thing in the sky. This is victory in the brain. It takes that energy to redirect the thought. And so where can I redirect the thought to? The third one here. Not only proper courtship, not only remembering your first love, but how about remembering your first love, meaning Jesus Christ. God gave us a sexual nature, not only to drive us into intimacy with our wives, but to remind us of the greater unity of Christ and his church. Remember, marriage is just a shadow. If you're think, thinking, well, well, come on, I'm single. This is not going to be as easy for me. No, no, no. That, married men can do this too. The greater intimacy is our intimacy with God. Not the marriage. The marriage is a shadow of the reality. The reality is found in Christ and his relationship with us. So bounce in the direction of, Lord, thank you for reminding me of the analogy of marriage and sexual intimacy, which teaches me about you. And then you're not thinking about sex anymore. You're not thinking about this attractive woman anymore. You're thinking about theologically deep things that angels have desired to look into. The mind dwelling on heavenly things is not in the low debasing area anymore. You've engaged that prefrontal cortex. The hippocampus hasn't sent that thing to the, to the, the occipital lobe to dwell upon and ruminate and think about and imagine, which then activates the amygdala and then this tension and this, this anxiety demanding more pleasure and acting out, none of that. The lust cascade doesn't happen because you've bounced in a different direction. You said, Lord, I want to bounce heavenward with this one. Bounce my eyes off of that image and fill my mind with the truth of what this sexual nature was given to me for. And then it backfires on the devil. Isn't this the most beautiful thing? We can use the sexual nature that God has given to us, that initial attraction, for a greater and deeper holiness. And then we're not living and wallowing in this just nasty animalistic feelings all the time of, of low debasing pleasure seeking thoughts. Now remember, this is a battle. The devil will come at you, resent every advancement of the enemy as an assault, a violent attack. He comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He was a murderer from the beginning. So temptation will happen. He's going to come after you. But when the conscious mind isn't making decisions and exerting the will, guess what is? The subconscious mind is going to rule. So vigilance is key. You've got to stay engaged in the battle all the time. But here's the thing. You don't have to fight him. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Stand ye still, O Judah and Jerusalem. See the salvation of the Lord with you. You don't have to do the, 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 the work and the fighting. You exercise the will to bounce. And yes, it does take some mental energy. Where do you get that energy from, by the way? From God. So you're in prayer this whole time. You're always looking to God. And you're saying, literally, this is a battle. And I'm going to say no to this advancement of the enemy. Recognize it as what it is. He's offering you the apples of Sodom. He's offering you a pleasurable moment, just a second and a half pleasurable moment, in exchange for your soul at that moment, in exchange for your connection with Christ. No way. This is a no-brainer. You tell him no. In fact, I actually do that. When, I, when an image pops up, I actually, the words, come, I actually say, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't know why I feel the need to be polite about it, but no, thank you. Just no, thank you. And immediately bounce the eyes. You're in prayer. Your thoughts are on heavenly things or the wife of your youth. And these things will replace those old habit patterns. That is the path to actually rerouting. You have to reroute it into something else. I'll tell you something that helps me. When I am thinking of heavenly things, I, I transport in my own imagination into the heavenly New Jerusalem. You know, you got the lion and the lamb lying down together. You see Jesus Christ in person, and I see myself there. And this is not some sort of like New Age, you know, uh, visualization. It's just a thought. It's like, wow, I will be in heaven because I'm staying pure by Christ's strength. I'm going to be there, and I see my wife there, and I see my kids there. 
And that woman, the, the woman who the devil held out, she's a soul too. She's a human being too. She's there with my family. Imagine the person who the devil used as a tempter, who was supposed to be the one that was to drag you down into hell along with her. No, 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 no. Care about her soul. If I am thinking about others and their well-being, I can't be thinking about pleasure and selfishness, can I? That these two don't occupy the same territory. True well-being for her is she, I, I, we're there together, my wife and I, in embracing. And here this dressed in white raiment, all the, 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 the women that God has created who are image bearers of her. Don't you want to have a sanctified view of women? I don't want to just never look at a, a, a woman. Now, I don't want to look at a woman with lust in my eyes and an attractive woman that is a danger to, to behold. You don't want to be <laughs> engaging, you know, and, and use this as an excuse to enjoy that beauty if you're struggling with this. But as God leads you, Use the wisdom to find your own strategies and techniques. And I can tell you, the Lord has given me tremendous victory in this area. And, and I, I, as I use these, these techniques, I actually, no thank you, bounce the eyes, using the, the, the thoughts of heaven and praying for that woman's conversion. She may not know about present truth. She may not know about Jesus Christ. So I'm praying to God for that person's conversion. That's another thing as you're thinking these spiritual things. Now, these temptations do come, but I want to make you a promise. When you take that deep breath, because you need that oxygen to the prefrontal cortex, when you have that moment of prayer, when you engage the will to bounce in a different direction, and you say, no, thank you, and you have heavenly thoughts, this temptation will pass. Okay, It will pass in moments. If you need to get out of the, the place where you are, the computer, wherever that's tempting you, leave the phone behind. Go for a 10-minute walk. You will get on with your day and your life with total happiness and you will not be depriving yourself of anything. You will find that the, the tempting moments will pass. So many people give in to temptation nearly every time that they just don't know about the peace that can come. You have greater joy, way greater joy when you say no to it. So if you need to get outside and exercise or call a friend or just do something else to replace what it is that you're doing because you don't want to just think about the battle all the time. You, you follow what I mean by that? If it's just like, okay, this is what I'm doing in the battle and now I'm just thinking and, and you know what, the temptation is still there. I just want to get out of the situation. The whole experience that I talked about with bouncing and all of these things, this is a few seconds. And then you're on to other things and you're filling the mind with other things. You don't want to just be, okay, I'm going to engage in this battle for the next hour and I'm not going to be tempted. No, if you're thinking about not being tempted, you're thinking about being tempted, aren't you? As we've talked about earlier. But you, you say in your mind, you know, I know what the lie is here. The lie is that this will bring me pleasure. And I actually know, and I, I know the fact, the truth, this will bring pain. This will not bring pleasure. I want more peace and joy with Jesus Christ. That, that, that truth, the truth will set you free, right? So you'll look away immediately. And here's the good news. With each decision to reroute, I'm not going to bounce off of the cliff again. I'm not going to go down that Grand Canyon. With each decision to reroute, you have now changed your brain for the better. Just one momentary victory. Just, I... I Praise the Lord. I didn't dwell on it for more than that millisecond. I didn't let the lust cascade happen. And the Lord gave me victory in that moment. That has changed your brain. Your brain is never the same. Every sentence you say, every thought you have, every meal you eat, the brain is always changing. And these decisions are crucial. And don't think it's always going to be this hard. Because the more you follow that pathway, you've gotten that machete out and you will have a whole new pathway. A whole new superhighway of purity that you can't help but go down, right? You, you, you will have a whole new road map network and a completely different neurological experience. Now, one other practical measure, by the way, as we're just wrapping up with some practicals. One addiction recovery specialist that I've listened to actually I thought this was a pretty good piece of advice. He says, have, have an emergency pack ready to go. So when you're especially tempted and, you know, you're home alone or whatever the situation is and you want to avoid all those situations, right, as many as possible when we talked about triggers. But a situation has happened where you feel like you're going like to fall. You're about to, I mean, the lust cascade is engaged. You're on the highway and you're going, oh, no, what have I done? There are off ramps. Brothers and sisters, don't say, well, I might as well go all the way then because I've already sinned. Nonsense. That's the devil's lie. He, if he causes you to do that more, it's going to reinforce it and damage your nature further. You don't want to fall back. And so have this emergency pack ready to go. You got to prepare this now before you start going down this, this journey of recovery. Have in the emergency pack a number of things. First of all, write yourself a letter. 
about yourself, about your aims in life and your identity in Christ. Here's who I am. This is the new creation. This is what I'm about. All of these things. Then have some pictures of your family, the people that would be affected by your decision. And then have a list of consequences of what it would do to you to, and to others if you decide to view the pornography or engage in the behavior or whatever. Fourth, list, have a list that you return to from time to time of, of victory milestones. Update that occasionally and say, this is how I've come this far by God's grace. You may have heard of how Alcoholics Anonymous does it with the coin, right? You've been sober for this long and you get a coin. You know, have these tokens of victory. It doesn't have to be a literal coin, but whatever. And have that and say, I've, I've gone this far and I'm going to throw this all away. No way. And you see the pictures of the family. And these are just some practical ways to just fire you back up to say, by God's grace, I'm going to do this. I'm going to look and live. And then when you have a lapse in judgment, by the way, and you dwell on that image for more than just the millisecond. You know, you started your day with Christ, yes. Um, you, you did all these things, but then you've lost that connection with him somewhere in the day. You neglected prayer. And when you have that lapse in judgment and you slip up, don't wallow in self-blame and condemnation and, and shame. You know what God says? Listen to this from the living the life of Enoch. He says, remember this. If you have made mistakes, you certainly gain a victory if you see these mistakes and regard them as beacons of warning. Thus, you turn defeat into victory, disappointing the enemy and honoring your Redeemer. So don't see the mistakes as failures. See them as learning experience of what doesn't work, right? Maybe you were on the computer late at night. Well, that was foolish of me. Why did I do? I should have known that when I did my trigger journaling. Should have never done that. I should have my electronics all off for the last hour before bed. Disrupts melatonin production in the brain when you're viewing a lot of bright lights and screens before bed. I'll sleep better and I won't have this temptation. All of that's off within an hour. I, I, I spend some time with the Lord before I go to bed or, or whatever the situation is. You, you find that you slipped. The Bible says that a righteous man falls, but he gets up seven times. A righteous man may fall, but he gets up. Set, he might, may fall seven times, but he gets back up. And that's what God calls us to do, to get back up. Now the last step. And this closing promise. Test this claim in your life. He who steadfastly adheres to the principles of truth has the assurance that his weakest points of character may become his strongest points of character. I'll tell you something. Personally in my life, I take the last step and I claim that promise. The last step is I have a new purpose, a completely new identity in Christ. We read about Enoch and Elijah and how they had an objective in their life. Find God's calling for you. Find that passion. And then God's promise will be revealed as you follow all these things and more things that God reveals to you. He will tell you that your weakest points of character will become your strongest. I've mentioned, not a recovering pornography addict, but being a male and a man in this culture, this is an area with every man's story. A lot of that was my story too. And we struggle with the lust of the eyes. We struggle with the lust of the flesh and, and how, we, how we view women. This was my weakest area years ago. The weakest area of character. Man, you would have put a beautiful image in front of me and I would have beheld that and been a captive to that every time. But I can tell you today that this is no longer the weakest area. And I can, I can say with a moderate level of confidence, I haven't analyzed every point and said and measured them all, so I don't want to be on record before God with that, but I believe God has given me victory in this life to the point where it is approaching the strongest area, where, where, where I'm, de I'm, I'm detested, I disgust it, I, I resent that assault of Satan. It comes at me, no. And we can get there, brothers and sisters. This is not something I've accomplished. I'm nothing special just because I speak up in front and have a video. I'm a regular person just like anybody. And God can do that in the weakest of us, the weakest of the weak, because in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. It's going to glorify him so much when the men in the church finally stand up and they say, we've had enough of this thing. We, we are completely useless and passive in this movement in the last days because we are so torn down by the lusts of the flesh. And God wants to awaken and raise up a generation of men who are going to say, 
it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I have a pure and holy passion. I have a greater desire. I have overcome the lust of the flesh. And I can say, I'm not going to let my guard down. I'm not going to say, well, I'm, uh, it's, it's, not, it's my strongest point of character now, so I can relax. Never, never, never. Eternal vigilance until Christ returns. And once the men of the church say that, and once the men of the church, instead of being the majority of them using pornography, we, 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 have, we have freedom from this, you will see the world changed. You will see leaders rise up. You will see movements occur. You will see preaching and evangelism and blessing of humanity like you have never seen. God wants to free us for something, free us toward something. And I pray for everybody here. I want to offer a prayer for everybody here and for everybody viewing this material that the Lord would do this work in your life personally starting today. And yes, it takes decisions. We've gone through a lot of material. How are we, how are we going to go forward? Make those decisions today. Don't delay don't say, well, you know, I'll do some of that. No, we've got to have a radical new life. If you need to view the material again, view it again. And say, Lord, what are you calling me to do? Not what does Scott suggest. It's what the Lord says. If I told you to do something that he tells you not to, don't let me be a stumbling block. These are some things that have worked for me. Some things that the experts are bringing out in addiction recovery. Things from Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. And so here you stand with a decision. How do I go forward? Will I remain in guilt and shame? Or will I accept the love of God and the power of God in my life to overcome every besetting sin. Let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that we have no merit in ourselves. Even many of us who are not pornography addicts we have righteousness that amounts to filthy rags. We all come before you humbly saying, Father, forgive us for our sins, which are many. I confess my sin and the sin of my people before you, Father. We need your righteousness. We need a renewal of the mind. We need a radical and drastic new start. And we pray for that now. I pray for power, for courage to move forward, for wisdom, tact, and discernment in decisions on these sensitive issues. Father, I pray that you would be the final word on all of these things for each man and woman viewing this material. And Lord, I just ask a special blessing on each soul, that your spirit would guard them about, that your angels would encamp about them, that fear and love you. And Lord, that they might come out the victors and we might see each other in heaven, clothed in white raiment, having overcome by the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name. The interesting thing about all of this is, I, I alluded to this before, but I want us to be aware of the potential bait and switch here. You have the World Economic Forum saying, you know, we know there are disruptions in food and energy coming and the policies continue. You're going to eat bugs. We're going to give you a great reset. You're going to own nothing. And you've got sort of this Bond villain persona, uh, you know, at, at, at the front. It's not a great sales pitch. I know I said this before, but I want to repeat it because in comes the knight in shining armor. In comes you got good cop, bad cop, right? Here comes the good cop. Oh, it's the Council for Inclusive Capitalism. So keep this in mind. Vatican agencies of influence behind the foil, the, the, the bait and switch here. And where that takes us next is Revelation 13, no buy, no sell. Top economists, we're about to abandon traditional system of money and replace it with digital blockchain. There you have it. We're going digital. You've heard me on Second Beast Rising and COVID Dystopia again and again and again and again talk about not just economic collapse to understand deprivation and dependency and thus control, but also the ushering in of the cashless society and the resetting of the currencies. They're announcing it from the... Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the session on resetting digital currencies. The World Government Summit same group of people we're going to have the traditional system of money replaced do you know how much easier it's going to be 
to enforce no buy, no sell when all financial transactions are digital. Central bank digital currencies are coming. What will the consequences be? Then you've got the Fed explores possibility of issuing digital currency. Canada says it will freeze the bank accounts of Freedom Convoy truckers who continue their anti-vaccine mandate blockades. They shut down the bank accounts of those protesters. World Economic Forum pushes for restricting certain types of actors and transactions. Well, that's pretty broad from using decentralized finance. So once they get this financial system in, they just let your, your unpopular protesters. They don't like you. Certain types of actors, whoever the demonized group of the day is, and we know in prophecy where that goes. Now, they wouldn't have to do this if there was no cash. They literally, they were running the banks in China, and China had to deploy tanks to protect banks from angry citizens seeking to withdraw their cash. So people are looking at that going, why are we still in this analog, populist, independence-driven, noble self-reliance model of personal finance where you can have your money? I'm imagining what the thoughts of globalist elite controllers who are Revelation 13 fulfillers must be thinking. We have to bring out tanks to keep people from... Let's just get rid of the cash already. This will be sold and propagandized, but at the end of the day, it'll be, are you in or are you out? Are you going to be, you know, bartering and almost Amish, or, or do you want to take part in society? There's going to be that bifurcation, not only with our digital and biological identities that are fused in the fourth industrial revolution in the AI revolution where we are upgrading humans, human 2.0 and you've got those who are left behind who are uh, insistent and resistant to this system and, and, and insisting on their own humanity and staying human and so there's going to be that caste system as Harari called it but also financially. I mean that's going to be the biggest incentive to push people into the new world order the great reset, the whole conglomeration Jesus invites us, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Artificial intelligence warning, AI capable of predicting and manipulating your future. That's where the control comes in. The internet knows you because of your data better than your spouse does, Scientific American. Because this is not just for selling us things. The technocracy will be able to utilize this data. Where is this taking us? You'll see how new faiths are actually emerging, new religions are emerging, secularism is fading, papacy and AI and literally new worldviews and religious viewpoints surrounding the rise of artificial intelligence are coming. We'll get into that and the literal worship of artificial intelligence, spiritual machines. What does former Google executive Ray Kurzweil mean? And he talks about spiritual machines. We're going to understand the nature of free will and the great controversy and how artificial intelligence and algorithmic manipulation based upon data collection and surveillance will alter the course of human decision making. Humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election, or whether in the supermarket this is my free will, that's over. In conversations in our homes, biometric information on our bodies, even the emotion we display in our face. Don't look now why you should be worried about machines reading your emotions, The Guardian reported. So if, if we understand religion in general as a story about authority, then in the 21st century we will have a new dataist religion or a new algorithmic religion which will tell people the source of authority is algorithms is big data algorithms if you have a big question in life or a small question in life the source of authority is the big data algorithms technocracy can transition now to rule by tech okay google who is joseph smith According to Wikipedia, Joseph Smith Jr. was an American religious leader and founder of Mormonism and the Latter-day Saint movement. Wow. Okay, now let's try Jesus. Okay, Google. Who is Jesus Christ? Here are some results from the web. Wow. 
jw.org to find out about Jesus. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, Alexa, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is a fictional character. With regard to food shortage, it's going to be real. The, the price of these sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia, it's in our country as well. You never thought you'd hear a president say, yeah, food shortages are coming, they're going to be real. The desire to monopolize, to transform food production, and no buy, no sell. The bottom line here as it relates to prophecy. Revelation 13, when it talks about a time where buying and selling will be prohibited, restricted, it will be most effective always to control people's buying and selling when they are the most deprived. They will be the most willing and eager to give up their liberty in exchange for being taken care of. You could call it a form of satanic siege. Any system where you're trying to eliminate self-government, self-reliance. We do know that global energy systems, food systems, and supply chains will be deeply affected. But there's a noble independence in country living, in the dignity of self-reliance, self-discipline, self-control. You can read about that in Child Guidance and in Adventist Home. I love those phrases. Noble self-reliance. We've got a country living message for a reason, and it's not just the practical aspects, though those are important. It's not just to retain some, some freedom and, and peace and prosperity during times where the world is crumbling. Most important are spiritual reasons. They're gonna to try to create scarcity, try to create starvation, actually, in the case of the Great Leap Forward. So in order to reset the table, you have to first turn the table over. You gotta create monopolization and food scarcity and disrupt the current system that again was reducing hunger and starvation, but we're gonna overturn that and you're gonna see how starvation is increasing. In other words, resetting the food system is another way to access data, acquire data, exercise surveillance, which then feeds into a system that can be reimposed as controls. And remember those who are outside the city, who are self-sufficient, who are raising their own provisions are the biggest concern to the World Economic Forum. But they say those outside the city are their version of those who are lost, they live different kinds of lives outside of the city. Some have formed little self-supplying communities. There are times coming, and they are here, that when we put our hands to the plow and to the soil, that the fruit of our labor, by God's miraculous power, will transpire. We're in the palm of God's hand. He is the almighty arm of sovereignty. We are just dust and ashes. We are just clay in the potter's hands, but we have a part to play. There will be a point where every earthly support will be cut off. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him and his waters shall be sure. That's a promise. That's a Bible promise. So there is no fear about the close of time of Earth's history. Food scarcity and monopolization, that one is big. It's happening right now. Energy scarcity, high-tech feudalism, economic catastrophe in the Great Reset, central bank digital currencies, civil unrest and the chaos strategy, and how all of these things combined are creating the environment, laying the foundation, building toward final events of Bible prophecy in Revelation 13, which is followed by the greater reset, the blessed hope.